Welcome to Washington Street United Methodist Church in this time of virtual worship. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us here today, and I pray that wherever you are and whoever you may be with, that you are enjoying a wonderful celebration of the 4th of July weekend. As we gather today, I want to uh, remind you that we have delayed in-person worship yet again, and we will continue to update you at our wsmethodist.org website and also on our e-blast if you would be willing to check those and be sure you know what's happening in the life of our church. I also want to announce to you that Austin Lippert and I will both be coming back to serve Washington Street for another year in ministry. And I invite you today to be in prayer for the Methodist congregations and pastors across our annual conference who are worshiping together for the first time today. We pray that they will be blessed in their new ventures in ministry, especially in this unique time of pandemic. And now would you please join me for our call to worship. Jesus invites us to move from law to grace, from sin to mercy, from slavery to freedom, and from death to life. What an invitation. Let us lift our voices in praise as we say yes to God's new way of living in the spirit. Let us worship the Lord. And now join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, who through your Son, Jesus the Christ, has given us new life by water and the Spirit, teach us how to live always in integrity of body, mind, and spirit, in obedience to your love, in the name of Jesus the Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now a reading from Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23, from the Anchor Bible. Hear now the word of the Lord. 
Do not then let sin hold sway over your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not put your members at sin's disposal as weapons of wickedness, but instead put yourself at God's disposal as those who have come to life from death and offer your members to God as weapons of uprightness. Sin is not to have sway over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then does this mean? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that if you put yourself at anyone's disposal in obedience, you become slaves of the one you obey, whether of sin, which leads to death, or of real obedience, which leads to uprightness? But thanks be to God, you who were once slave to sin, have wholeheartedly become obedient to the standard of teaching to which you have been entrusted. Freed then from sin, you have become slaves to, uh, of uprightness. I am putting this in human terms because of your weak human nature, just as you used to put your members slavishly at the disposal of impurity and iniquity, which led to anarchy. So now put them slavishly at the disposal of uprightness, which leads to holiness. When you were slaves of sin, you were free from uprightness. But what benefit did you have then? Did you then have, save things of which you are now ashamed, things that result in death? But now that you have been freed from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you have leads to holiness, which results in life eternal. For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
law and grace, sin and mercy, freedom and obedience, death and life. I read this text from the Anchor Bible Commentary because it is the clearest tr translation for this passage that I could find. In this passage, Paul addresses the difficulty of moving from our old way of living to our new way of life in the way of Jesus. This transition is complicated. It's not like turning a light on in a dark room. It's not like opening your eyes after surgery to the bright light of a recovery room. And it's not like leaving the coolness of an air-conditioned space and stepping into the humid, famously hot weather of Columbia, South Carolina. No, this is a lifelong transition from what theologians call the human natural bent to sin to what is made possible through the love of God revealed in Jesus the Christ. Regardless of the translation you use, this transition is complicated. It's as complicated as the web of relationships that were portrayed in the 2009 movie titled, It's Complicated, starring Meryl Streep, Alec Baldwin, and Steve Martin. Now don't go and rent this movie because it is not family friendly. In other words, it's not suitable for everyone in your family. In this movie, Meryl Streep and Alec Baldwin were previously married and had three delightful children together. While the divorce had been amicable, because of said children, he was in and out of her home on a fairly regular basis. He had remarried, but she had remained single. And then she hired Steve Martin to remodel her kitchen. A new romance began to blossom. When Alec Baldwin, the ex-husband, noticed her new love interest, he was surprised by his feelings of jealousy. He discovered that he was jealous for the woman and the marriage he had left behind. The movie is a tale about their struggle to really let go of their old ways of interacting with one another, their old ways of dealing with the covenant of marriage, and embracing wholeheartedly the new lives they had chosen. The emotions were complicated, the relational dynamics were complicated, the physical boundaries were complicated. This movie dramatically portrays how we humans have a real tendency to cling to old ways of living. It's true in complex situations like this one, and it's also true in simple things. I've lived in the parsonage in Irmo for four years, and I will occasionally reach over and flip the switch on the left side of my kitchen sink. I fully anticipate that the lights will come on, but I'm startled because the disposal begins to run. Unfortunately, in my house in Charleston, the switches were flipped. So I cannot ever remember which side controls which device. Transitions are difficult. I bought a new to me vehicle almost two years ago. The cruise control is on the left side of the steering column. But almost every time I drive on the interstate and set my cruise control, I reach to the right, where for 10 years I set the cruise control on my beloved Camry. Transitions from the old to the new are difficult. That's why addictions are so hard to overcome. That's why abusive emotional patterns in relationships are so difficult to change. That's why it's hard to leave behind all ways of living, what Paul names sin, and to wholly embrace the way of Christ, which Paul refers to as uprightness. 
In chapter 7, he calls this new life a new way of the Spirit. As complicated as transitions are, though, Paul says you will be obedient to sin or you will be obedient to uprightness. You will use all of who you are as a weapon of wickedness and destruction or as a weapon of uprightness. He reminds us that we choose to whom we will be obedient, to the forces of evil or to the goodness of God. Surely when we look at the life of Jesus, we see one who chose consistently to embody the goodness of God, who, one who chose to embody the radical love of God every day of his life. He chose to love Gentiles, Jews, and Samaritans without distinction. He proclaimed his message of the coming reign of God to all, venturing into Samaritan territory, traveling into Gentile territory, preaching in synagogues, and visiting the temple. He chose to love women and welcome them into his inner circle when he visited the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he welcomed Mary to sit at his feet like a disciple, like all of the males who followed him from place to place. Jesus welcomed the despised tax collectors, people like Zacchaeus who confessed his sin publicly, and the woman who was caught in adultery who could not hide in the light of day what she had done in the darkness of night. Jesus chose to love them, to love them into new life. Jesus always seemed to be welcoming the marginalized. He chose to be with those who were sick, those who were less abled in body or mind, even those who were weak in spirit. Jesus surrounded himself with women, with children, and with the poor, who were largely the forgotten and the overlooked. Jesus chose to live in a way of radical love, even when it set him at odds with his family, with his religion, with his culture, and with the government. As the Philippian hymn states, he humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Every day because of Jesus, we are free to choose the way we will live. Paul said we will be obedient to sin or to real obedience, which leads to life. Jesus chose real obedience. Because of his choice, he suffered a tragic death at the hands of those who were motivated by the sin of power. We have a brass cross, but the cross of Jesus was ugly. It was real. His death was real. He was entombed. But on the third day, the God of radical love defeated the power of sin and death and raised him to that life that will never end. If you call yourself a Christian, which I assume that most of you do, you have already chosen to follow Jesus. You've already, through the waters of baptism, been born into that new life in the Spirit. 
Yet you, like me and Paul and the Christians in Rome, probably struggle to live like Jesus, to be obedient to the way of the Spirit that is the radical love of God. We struggle with the simple things as well as the complicated ones. While we long to live in the way of Jesus, we often struggle to include everyone at God's table of love. Like all people, we struggle to live beyond the distinctions of race and economic status, to live beyond the barriers that we construct to distinguish ourselves one from the other. We struggle to let go of the motivations that are born of ambition or fear. We struggle to commit ourselves fully to the radical love of God that challenges us to labor for justice and for the common good of all people. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. When I read those words, I thought maybe it's not as complicated as it sounds. Maybe it boils down to the very simple question. Who do you want to be like? You chose Jesus when you were baptized or when you were confirmed. Do you choose him today? Do you choose today to be like Jesus? In the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose moment by moment to love like Jesus. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose this new way of living. In so choosing, we yield ourselves to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, and we become partners with God in the transformation of the world. And the hope of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us choose to be like Jesus. Let us choose the radical love of God. Amen and amen. Thank you.
Let us pray together. We are thankful, holy God, that through Christ Jesus you have set us free from sin. Help us to live into our freedom by choosing obedience to your way of love. Give us strength to choose love over hate, mercy over judgment, humility over power, and may we commit ourselves to the way of peace and justice as we seek to embody the radical love of Jesus, through whom we pray. We unite our voices now as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mark Miller wrote a beautiful anthem as a tribute to the Emmanuel Nine. It was called, I Choose Love. 
Our lesson today invites us to choose the new way of the Spirit. May we go forth to live in the peace, justice, and radical love of Jesus Christ. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.